Well, this is obviously the wrong slide set. <laughs> Hang on a minute while we get the right slide set. Um, it should be the right set, Linda, if you want to oh, just go to the next one. It's got Nigus there. Is it? I know, I, I brought it. I did. There I'm she sure is. It was, there she is. No, that's fine. Don't worry. We'll nip through these quickly. Oh, we're in the same place anyway. That's interesting. Okay. We've had a couple of blips today, I have to say. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the background here. Um, I visited Iran in October last year. Um, I was invited to go to speak to, uh, as a result of the VIDM, actually, from this from last year, I was invited over because the midwives and the government in Iran are trying to promote more physiological birth. Now, there was a presentation during the night for those of us in the UK, which is recorded, and I will put the recording up shortly onto the website that you could go to, at which they talked about the background and differences between Australia and Iran, actually. But the, the differences are similar if you're talking about any um, developed country. Um, uh, and so I, the, the, there is a very, it is a very medicalized um, maternity services. There are many more obstetricians or what they call gynecologists there than there are midwives, and they um, are in charge of all births. But the government are wanting to promote physiological birth um, because they're wanting to encourage an increase in the population size. Um, which has become a bit stagnant. Um, and uh, with so many people having cesarean sections, they are choosing to have smaller families. So there's a big move on there to, um, to introduce physiological birth. So I was invited over to Iran, and I run with a, a mid, another midwife friend um, a four-day workshop uh, introducing the concepts of physiological birth and water birth. So as a result of that, Fatima was at that workshop, and when she went back to her own city, um, which is the city of Koramabad in, I think, southern Iran, she wanted to um, practice this physiological birth, particularly water birth. So this is the story of her water birth. So Fatima Arus Husseini has got a master's degree in midwifery, and this is the case study of her water birth. And this is Fatima. You've seen that picture up at all as well. Very pretty, don't you think? Um, she is a, an experienced midwife. She's done a variety of courses. She is a teacher as well. She's been a midwife for 12 years, um, and she works in a governmental-run um, maternity hospital. There are both governmental and private hospitals. The medicalization of the private hospitals is worse than it is at the governmental hospitals. So, as she has told us here, childbirth in Iran is very medicalized with gynecologists in charge of all the births. And I've told you a little bit more about that already. Um, but I'm not too sure. I, I, I've, I, had, I had some conversations with gynecologists in Iran, and I think they're part of the system too, in that they're having difficulties um, seeing beyond the medicalized side of it. It is a powerful picture, isn't it? <laughs> There's a nice one to, to offset that when we get towards the end of the presentation. So it's very medicalized in, 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 in Iran. And also, and which makes it a lot worse, is that the midwives are, are given very little responsibility. They're, they are what, in this country, we would call obstetric nurses. They just do what the um, obstetricians, the gynecologists tell them to do. Uh, the, although they have a four-year degree course to become midwives, um, they don't have uh, accepted responsibility um, for the women that they care for. Um, they do run private clinics. They do have private clinics, and they do take on private um, patients, so to speak, or women, clients. Um, I found it difficult to understand exactly what the place of that clinic was, because I, I believe that... Um, even in their clinics, they then have to negotiate with the gynecologist to be allowed um, to manage the, the, the woman's birth. Can women be gyne Well, I didn't see any men. I only saw female gynecologists, which to ex some extent, extent surprised me. Maybe, Fatima, you could text me and tell me how many, if there are men gynecologists, because, as I say, I only saw women. And I saw quite a few. 
So um, cesarean sections are very common. Women tend to think in Iran that a cesarean section is an indication of wealth. Um, and they also consider that this is uh, a safer, a less painful birth. Um, and um, there is the issue of um, the vaginal bypass, I was told by some, in that it does retain um, the integrity of the vaginal canal. Um, so for all those reasons, cesarean section reaches 90% in some hospitals. Um, and of course, there are, there's increasing evidence that cesarean section is not a safe option. Um, and there are many complications. And I suspect that that will also reduce the, the number of babies the women have. So about eight years ago, the government began an initiative, yes it is, um, to promote physiological birth. The problem with that is you can't just say everybody else, everybody's got to have a nice normal birth now. Uh, you've got to change people's attitudes towards this. And this could be, this is something we were going to ask all of you. Um, there are, there's the gynecologists, there's the midwives, and the women. So how do you think we, we, can, have, we can suggest to the, the midwives of Iran would be a good way of um, encouraging women and midwives and gynecologists that physiological birth is a good option? What do you think? How do we change society's views? Number of children? What do you mean by number of children? All right, so to um, explain to uh, everybody that, and that of course is from what I understand, and I only spent nine days in Iran, and I have been talking to Iran almost nonstop ever since. Um, from what I gather, that is the reason for encouraging physiological birth. Um, the government seems to be on board with that, but it's everybody else you've got to get on board. Education, 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 yes. <laughs> yes, have community outreach programs. Yes, the government's got to be behind it. While I was in Iran, we were actually asked to go and speak to um, the government. It was a very interesting um, meeting. We had just got off the plane. Um, having traveled all night, um, we hadn't had much to eat for the last few hours, and we were going to meet them over breakfast, but breakfast was some fruit. <laughs> um, but they were telling us that they, they have um, a large amount of money that they want to put behind an empowering woman project in order to empower the women to, be, to become entrepreneurs, actually, and start thinking about running businesses, et cetera. So education has to be part of it. Interestingly enough, I did speak to one of the lecturers who at the university where they train the midwives, and she told me that they only have one textbook. I don't know whether this is totally true. Remember, there's a big, big language barrier here too. Um, she said that they just use one of the American obstetric textbooks, and that's the only way, the only way in which the midwives are taught. So they are already getting a medicalized, um, a medicalized culture coming through their education. Something like Sweden's public commercial, but appropriate for that culture. Has Sweden have they have they developed some kind of uh, education? I don't know about that. Yes, I, I agree, Alufemi, that um, women in some countries are not terribly keen to face the challenges of physiological birth. And, and to be honest, um, we, we have a speaker later on who's going to talk about the media and how the media has influenced that. Um, because I don't know about in your country, but in my country, there are lots of um, programs showing childbirth as it is, like one born every minute. Um, and they show a very skewed version of childbirth where women scream and uh, are very and it's very frightening to people. 
So I, I think you're a little bit unfair in some extent, Olufemi, but it's not, um, you're not wrong either, a bit of be each. Jane, what's your thoughts? You got any ideas so, how uh, we can... Can you hear me okay? Sorry, hopefully my sound's okay. You're a bit faint. Can you hear me? So, so okay. don't worry if you... Sorry, can you hear me now? Yep, a little bit better, yep. I was just wondering if you've got any thoughts about how to um, how to encourage women and obstetricians and midwives to accept physiological birth rather than a medicalized birth. Well, I think it, it really feeds into our talk last night. It's all about the and saying intervention is important in the right place, but we need to have a pro you know at least eighty percent of our population should be able to have normal physiological birth with low intervention and being cared for by midwives. So I think knowing um, knowing what's normal and knowing what's not normal and then having services that all work cohesively together, that's important. Yes, yes indeed. And ginger, 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 is that how you pronounce it? What do you mean by less people at the birth? Ah. Okay, are most of the people present a cesarean male or female? Well, again, I don't really know. I know that in Iran, um, the, the husband is not encouraged to be present at the births. So that's one male out of the way. And as I've already said, all the gynecologists I met were female. So um, it's possible. That's true as well. Um, I think part of the problem is that they, the, the, the women in Iran, from what I saw and what I gathered, are used to submitting to whatever is thrown at them. They don't seem to have an awful lot of empowerment. So we're back to that again. Of course you can post a link, please do. It's in the chat box, so that would be wonderful if you would like to do that. How long has there been a history of cesarean section? Um, from what I gather, it's at least 20 years or something like that. We have male midwives in this country too. So there's a few suggestions there for Fatima to uh, mull over and her midwife colleagues. Anyway, so, um, and I've already said this is part of what I've already discussed, that um, the, the women themselves believe that a cesarean section was better than a normal birth. So this is, this is us in Iran <laughs> with Fatima. This is me in the middle. And to my left, to the left, is Alison, who is a wonderful midwife from here in Scotland, um, who is a, a, a midwife-led unit midwife, so to speak, um, and in fact was my daughter's midwife, and that's why I took her, because she was fabulous. And on the right is Fatima. So she had, we, we had this workshop, there were something like 30-odd senior midwives came to the workshop to um, do discuss and consider how to change the different maternity hospitals in Iran um, to consider physiological birth. So after that workshop, Fatima says she was thinking about water birth a lot and she thought about how can I do that? How can I find a mother to speak to her about it? Because in my country, mothers do not have enough information about water birth. And then about two months after the workshops, a mother was referred to her own private clinic or her own clinic. And um, this mother was 23 years old, a prima gravida, and was at 34 weeks of pregnancy. I will answer that question, Becky. Yes, there were a few gynecologists popped in, and one of, which, one of whom we were talking about episiotomy at the time, which is mandatory for all prima gravitas in Iran. Do you remember when that used to be the case here in the UK? Um, and um, she agreed with us that a physiotomy was not necessary. <laughs> so some people, some of the gynecologists um, do not agree with the kind of standard care. That's, um, family size tends to be quite small, but that's I don't understand too much about that one, and I would have to ask for more information about that. So anyway, so Fatima saw this woman and thought that maybe she was an ideal candidate for a water birth. And the woman told her that she was really frightened about the labor, work, the labor pain um, and the pisiotomy. Um, and 
I suppose, was swithering about what type of birth she would have. Now, I don't really understand, despite asking her several times why Fatima chose this one in particular, although I do know that she was low risk or, or didn't have any, um, I shouldn't say that, we're trying to get away from the risk word now. She had didn't have any um, history that would uh, stop the, her from having a physiological birth. So she, um, Fatima realized that this might be a lady who would be uh, susceptible to some conversation about her choices, including that of water birth. So she asked her, did she want any, any information about water birth? Shall we have a talk about it? Shall we educate you about water birth? And she welcomed the idea, and that was why Fatima decided that uh, this was an option for this particular woman. Um, and she said that she wanted Fatima to talk to her husband and her mum. And uh, this Fatima did at 36 weeks. And they explored the whole process of water birth. And as Fatima said, she, she tried to give her a very balanced view about what all the benefits and complications are about water birth, about a normal vaginal delivery, as she's put here, about cesarean sections. And she showed them some films about water birth. Now, it, that's just reminded me, actually. Um, we had a speaker last year called Layla, who was, the, in fact, the one who invited me to Iran. And she, um, she works in the private maternity system. And she uh, does water birth antenatal classes. And she and her colleagues had produced some uh, advertisements, which they put onto the TV to promote uh, laboring in water. Um, so there is an ongoing changes in the um, in Iran. Okay, so Fatima said that she told them quite honestly that this was her first experience, but she would do this, um, and she had been educated about this. And the wo woman and her family decided that they would trust her, and she was very proud and um, honoured that um, they would trust her to. Um, conduct their first, her first water birth with them. So this is the facilities, and we were discussing this last night. Their, their physiological birth room, which is an interesting concept, is quite small, and it does not appear to have many of the things that we think would be useful in a, in a physiological or physiologic birth room that we would like. Um, I asked if the lights could be dulled, and she said that, um, no, they can't, um, that they're strip lights, and so you can't do much about that. So uh, they're very much at the beginning of the whole process of um, offering physiological birth. So um, this is the room, and that's the water pool that they've got, and you can see all the facilities like that there. So when the woman rang in her 38th week, she called her to tell her that the pains were starting, and um, and then of course she uh, she examined her to make sure all was normal, and she made sure all her equipment was ready um, for this birth. Now someone has asked physiological birth, medicalized birth, and water birth. Am I missing the difference? Um, medicalized birth is one that is managed. Physiological birth is one that is left to. Um, were left to um, to be very natural and follow the uh, hormones of birth, and a water birth is kind of a subset of that. So this is the equipment that she had for a water birth. If you lose sound, sorry, Linda. sorry, I'm still here. I was just, um, I'm still here. It was just that I had um, some students popped in, so I just had to explain to them what was happening. Okay, so this was their their uh, facilities that they've got in her hospital. Anyway, so the mother came in at 38 weeks, and um, Fatima makes the point that she was actually quite an obese lady at 93 kilograms. Um, but she was admitted at 9 o'clock at night and was 4 centimetres dilated. And she spent her labour 
um, educating her and her grand and the grandmother of the baby about um, using breathing exercises, movement in the water pool, using the birth pool, and using massage, etc. Um, she she made the point. She told me last night that the grand she, that she the woman chose to have her mother with her as an attendee, attendee um, and I heard uh, previously that um, the partners, the men, are not allowed in, but it did seem to be an option for this woman. So that might not be the case everywhere. And one of the biggest problems, of course, is to get um, reliable information. And Iran is a big country, and they do not um, they do not have protocols and procedures anything like we do in the UK and in many other countries that kind of direct um, how maternity care is given. Anyway, where are we? So, oh, no, I wanted to say, so what do you all think about the fact that this woman was 93 kilograms in weight and was for a water birth? Yes, I know. I agree, Jane. Um, I, I, uh, this is an issue for many people. And in fact, my daughter as well was... Um, uh, my question was merely, uh, what did anybody think about the fact that the woman was 93 kilograms and was considered a good candidate for a water birth, especially one that was the first water birth? Um, uh, Fatima did tell me that she had absolutely no history whatsoever that would uh, mean that she was not a suitable candidate really for a water birth. So she was quite happy to go ahead with this water birth. And as someone said just then, um, it does make um, a lot of difference to people if they are quite heavy. It seems to be an advantage, really. Well, it doesn't seem to be. It is an advantage to them. It's, it still needs to be low risk. Yes, I know. I know. Is there a better word? I have no idea. And yes, the BMI above 35 is, a, is an interesting concept because um, it might be above our protocol, but I don't know what country Chatham Girls in, I'm guessing in the UK, but uh, we do follow the rules that women are entitled to choose their place of birth. Um, and with negotiation, well, not negotiation, but with um, full discussion, they should be able to give birth in, in water, even if they are outside the so-called protocols. And that's another story for another day, of course. There you go. That's a very good point that Joy has put there, that um, the risks of a cesarean section are greater from a cesarean section than it would be from a normal birth. So I also feel that uh, water birth would be ide idea, ideal. Well, sorry. So we've agreed, really, that uh, this woman, there was no reason why this woman should not have a water birth. So this woman is just, this is this woman's first baby. And I was quite surprised, but pleased to see that uh, the, she delivered it, or she gave birth, I'm sorry, at midnight. She came in at nine centimeters, at nine o'clock, remember, four centimeters dilated, and it was born at midnight. Now, this is that baby. I asked that last night. This is that baby um, at the moment of birth, just after birth. A 3.6 kilogram baby, 36 centimeter head circumference. And everything happened within the water. The mother didn't need an episiotomy, but had a little laceration that she repaired with five sutures. And so it's absolutely wonderful to hear that the birth went so well. And it's also very nice to see the picture too. There are so many questions I would have about things like delayed cord clamping and about um, you know, um, what kind of cares were given during the process of birth. But I think um, the language side of it makes it difficult to ask those questions. Um, and it does worry me a little bit about things like the depth of the pool and such like, yes, because you'd expect the water to cover the abdomen, etc. So there's a whole load of things that we've been able to get to within the um, UK, for example. We've been able to develop fine tuning, such as optimal cord clamping, etc. Um, but they're not ready for that yet. And good for them to be 
trying to um, encourage physiological birth. Okay, so that was her story uh, about how to, about her first water birth, and she tells me that she's had another one since then, which also went um, very quickly, and she's very pleased with her experiences on giving women this choice, <clears throat> and the fact that the women trust her to, um, to support her throughout this. She says that she feels that God is supporting her in this um, pursuit of physiological birth and water birth, um, and but how to actually expand this within her practice and within Iran is another issue. Um, she was telling me that the people she works with thinks that she's um, she should not be um, promoting physiological birth um, because it's not safe. I was just looking at the com com comment here about allowing the cord to pulse anti-physiology. Yes, it's like um, in the third stage, whether or not you ask the woman, would you explain to a woman about active and physiological third stage? Because actually, if you just are going to do a physiological third stage, why explain an intervention unless it's necessary? <laughs> So rather than say, would you like an active or a physiological third stage because this is this and this is that, well, do you need to have that conversation at all? Unless there's a reason why you might need to say, okay, so it's not working physiologically, um, therefore we do have to think of an option. What we could do is do oxytocin, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> no, physiological birth is not unsafe, provided the woman is well supported and has good midwifery care from educated people. Ali Femi. So you're quite right about that. There, there is, it's not unsafe. The problem is that people can people see childbirth as being um, something that needs to be managed, <coughs> and yet women have been having babies for donkeys years, for eons, quite successfully, and the the um, mortality rates are quite low. Uh, so it's our intervention that are causing the problems, really. So that's um, Fatima's story. Have we got any questions? And I'll ask if she wants to add anything. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Cool. I'll answer it if I can. I don't know. How is my sound? Is it really quiet again? It's, it's audible. It's fine. I just wanted to know uh, all the wonderful midwives and birth attendants that are here um, who actually uh, participates in water birth uh, on the call here today and, and who's able to actually provide this care for all our wonderful women. We could just talk, maybe chat in the text box about that. So the question was, how many of you out there get involved in water birth that do water birth? Multiple people, Val, is it? Claudia has families in Washington. Becky in Virginia. Katie in Detroit. Here we, we do a lot of water births in the UK. Um, we have many midwife-led units now in the UK, and water birth is generally um, offered in all of those places. Standard care in Chatham. Chatham. I'm assuming Chatham, the girl, you are from Chatham. Okay, so Katie Page says they don't currently offer water birth in the hospital. Okay, so you don't, because you haven't got a policy and you haven't got your staff training. Oh, Jill. Hi, Jill. Okay, so um, is there, are there plans in um, whatever VA is? What is VA in the US? I'm not very good at my US states. Katie, is there a plan to train up people and um, start offering water birth? Oh, Virginia, sorry. 
I probably should have known that, Katie. <laughs> so are you planning water birth? What if a woman comes to you and says, I want a water birth? Does she have that right? It's possible to begin to change the culture. Yes, Joy, you, you should be the person to be able to answer some of these questions. And, and I'm sure you have a sense of the difficulties that the midwives in Iran must be happening. Yeah. Um, I keep saying to them, we need to, you need to make change in small, small chunks because um, I feel that uh, going straight for water birth is maybe a little bit quick and maybe they should be thinking about the environment of birth and reminding themselves about hormones of birth and... Um, I feel that I would like to go back to Iran now that I know more about it and do a different kind of workshop from the one we did in which water birth would be a very small part of it and the most of it would just be about um, um, providing uh, the perfect environment to, um, to uh, support the women and, um, um, and encourage physiological birth. So Katie says that uh, they try to get women out of the tub before birth to birth on land, but if they don't, well, there you go. And if, if they do give birth underwater, then um, they um, they have to fill in forms, etc. This was the same case here, I might add, um, just, what, I don't know, 15 years ago probably, before uh, they became, maybe 20 years ago, before water be birth became quite so uh, accepted. I can also add that in um, in Iran, um, the the gynecologists um, are telling everybody that water birth is unsafe, as they are saying that physiological birth is unsafe. Um, and I was trying to encourage the midwives to think about evidence and providing the evidence and having the evidence at their fingertips about the whether or not any of these things are safe or not. They need to know the evidence. And when I was talking about the risks of cesarean section, they were quite surprised that there were risks of cesarean section. Because it's obviously been marketed very well as a supposedly um, safe option. What about the idea that water birth opens the discussion for physiological birth? Not too sure what you mean there, Becky. Yes, Joy was saying that, um, and that's the same in most of the birth centres I know as well, that uh, most of the women use water and most of them stay in the water to give birth. It seems the most natural thing to do. Yes, you're right, Catherine. Um, they do say that the first water births were in Russia, in the sea, I think. Um, and then there was Michel O'Donnell was, was uh, promoting it in his um, French clinics. Um, Yes, and I think that's the point I made when I was over in Iran, uh, Joy, that confidential inquiries that we do in the UK that look at the statistics show that women are three times more likely to die from a cesarean section than they are from a normal birth. And that's, that's uh, what's not been mentioned in this country, let alone elsewhere. It's, it's a huge, big discussion area, isn't it? The whole um, issue of physiological birth and stopping the medicalization how do you reverse that trend having said that i would say that we've done that pretty well in the uk because we got to that kind of low area um, a few years ago and we had to um fight really to get back the um autonomy of midwives and uh the empowerment of our women and now we, we are still got a lot of medicalization but we've also got a lot of uh, um midwife led units which encourage physiological birth so yes um i think the problem is that when people in a country find um uh, start hearing about something like water birth that seems to epitomize um physiological birth that, that, that it seems to be like that's 
that seemed to them to be a, 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 a wondrous thing, a very normal, natural thing. And it does, of course, help with pain relief, as Becky has just mentioned. Water is for drinking. In my country, water is for drink. Well, I always say that actually water birth, to me, water birth is not natural because if you look at the animal kingdom, um, not many land mammals choose to give birth underwater. I think the hippopotamus or something like that is the only other one that does this. Um, so I've always said that when we when we were trying to change um, childbirth to becoming more less medicalized and more physiological in the UK, people were a bit like teenagers. They kind of rebelled and went further than they needed to, to in order to do that rebellion against medicalization and chose to have water birth. I think one of the other problems about Iran is that they don't the midwives do not have their own regulation. They're regulated by the medical council um, and they don't have protocols and uh, they do not have seem to have any um, method of um, proof of education before practicing something. So I think there's a big, huge political change needed there as well before they can take charge of their own education and their own practice. Fatima seems to have disappeared. Has she gone down? Did she log out and come back in again? Nope, she seems to not be here. Maybe that storm has thrown her out altogether. Question I posed from earlier, talk to the husband and the mum, is this a cultural component? I know in some cultures you have to get the husband and mother-in-law or the mother on board. Yeah. I think that there is definitely that issue also in Iran. Okay, so any more questions because um, Fatima has left and I really can't give you an awful lot more about um, what she was going to speak about um, and we could perhaps does anybody have any general questions about water birth or physiological birth i think you're absolutely right ginger that um once you get some women um experiencing something like water birth or physiological birth um they will then spread the word won't they Yes, the issue of physiological birth can be addressed by asking people what their traditional practice is. Sometimes women know the, oh, right, of course, uh, I hadn't thought of that. I know that um, in some areas where the, it's not, they don't have an awful lot of medical um, support, that the, there are tribal practices and um, home births and such like, because there are no home births at all in the cit cities. That's not an option. Yes, I totally agree, Becky, that we should thank Fatima um, for trying to challenge the system. She, she's asked if I will keep in contact with her after the conference, and um, hopefully I keep sending her links to various papers, etc., to enable her to be educated and hopefully um, educate uh, her colleagues and the women that she's caring yeah. for. It is a huge topic is a huge feminist topic yes I agree and I'll pass that on to her so I'm still reading all the comments that are coming up in the chat box this is a really useful and interesting chat going on here Interesting that you're talking about um, those links that are growing. Um, I had a midwife colleague stay at the weekend and she said that I'm a web weaver because I keep bringing people in from different places and weaving them into things that I'm involved with and then throwing them out and they're going out together to work together. And I think that's what the social media is all about, is, is weaving people together and taking on opportunities. Thank you for that compliment. 
In Guyana, you do not have this practice. Is that this practice of water birth? Yes. Is it very medicalized in your country? Childbirth? So you'll have some of the problems to um, Fatima then. I'm not too sure, Tracy, what you're saying. No, it's not too. <laughs> Do we have any tips for student midwives who might be struggling with demands of working within the NHS? Oh, that's another big, huge subject, isn't it, Rose? Um, you know, we've got a, a student cafe later on this evening. I think it's at um, 6 o'clock. No, 7 o'clock. No, 8 o'clock. I'll get it right in a minute. It's at 8 o'clock. Um, and although it's going to be talking about student electives, we expect to be talking about other things as well. So um, you'd be very welcome to come to that uh, at 8 o'clock this evening. You really enjoyed this presentation. <laughs> well, that's a great thing to hear. Okay, so maybe we should have a break and um, move on to the next person who happens to actually be in the same room as I'm in uh, right now. So you talk about web weaving. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, there was a comment about Nepal. Wish there were midwives from Nepal in this chat. Well, do you know, I sent um, lots of uh, social media information in their direction to invite them to the VIDM. So, um, Joy, I will work with you uh, any time to encourage people from these countries to come to the BIDM and discuss what they've been doing. Yeah, we will sort that one out. We actually have already referred to the RCM's um, information about electives, Joy. So we know about that. I'm, I'm doing that session as well. I'm kind of overseeing it. Thank you, Chatham Girl. <laughs> we, we kind of anticipated it was a possibility we might need to do this. OK, so I'm definitely I'm going to sign off now um, and finish off this presentation in the usual fashion. And it's recorded, Joy. So um, you, you, once we've got it on the website, maybe you could direct your colleagues in Nepal to um, listen to it. And it might help with what they are seeking to do. And my thanks to Fatima as well. So I'm just going to start to stop.